Well, please be seated, everyone. If you're not, most of you are, aren't you? But some of you might not be. Well, welcome, everyone, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. May the Lord be with you. Well, it's lovely to, uh, to see you at, uh, at church today, uh, whether you're joining us uh, in person, uh, perhaps for the first time, or you're new to the life of St. Peter's, uh, or whether you're watching us online. And uh, it's great that we can be here on this Sunday after Easter to celebrate the wonderful fact that Jesus is alive. We marked nearly 2,000 years since uh, that incredible first Easter. We were thinking about last weekend how Jesus died on a cross to save us from our sins, and he rose again and is alive forever. And we're going to be unpacking that. We're going to be doing a bit of research today to think about why that's really good news and how we can believe it. Um, when you came in, you should have been given a, uh, a service booklet, and uh, there's quite a sort of a uh, a cacophony of all sorts of different um, inserts in that today, and each one of those is really good, um, and we'll, we'll explain some of those as we go through. But everything that you will need will either be in that booklet, uh, on this pew sheet, or on the screen. Um, and if you're not sure where to look, just see what the person next to you is doing and just copy them, and you'll be fine. Um, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to say the prayer of preparation. And this is a chance that however our week's been, whether it's been really busy or stressful, or maybe it's been quite quiet. Uh, it's a chance for us to commit our time now to the worship of Almighty God. So the words will appear both on the screen and at the bottom of page one of our booklet. So let's say this prayer together. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, we're going to stand and we're going to sing our first hymn on this uh, Easter, uh, Sunday after Easter. Please stand. Please do be seated. Well, we're reminded in the Easter story that God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son uh, to save us from our sins and to bring us to eternal life. So that means that when we gather together, we want to say sorry to God for the things that we've done that we know we shouldn't have and the things that we haven't done that we know that we should. So we're now going to join in with our prayer together as we ask God for forgiveness. Almighty God, our heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbor in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, 
who died for us, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. So may Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now we're going to uh, stand and uh, sing the Gloria. The words will also appear on the screen as, uh, as we uh, stand and praise God with these words. Mighty Father, you have given your only Son to die for our sins and to rise again for our justification. Grant us so to put away the leaven of malice and wickedness, that we may always serve you in pureness of living and truth, through the merits of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please do be seated. Well, in just a moment, we're going to have our first reading, and Jane's going to bring that to us from uh, the book of Acts. But just before that, we've got a few items of church family news. Um, the first to say is please do join us for refreshments that are served in the community center straight after the service. an opportunity not just for us to uh, have tea and coffee and cake, but for us to get to know one another, to uh, ask questions, how one another's doing, and to get to meet new people. Um, it's what we call a good time of fellowship, uh, where we spend time with one another. Um, Wednesdays at St. Peter's is our chance to go deeper in our faith with God. We do that through prayer, through worship and Bible study. Uh, normally we would have a Bible study this Wednesday, but because it's half term and people are away, uh, that's not going to happen. The next one will be in a fortnight's time. But the following Wednesday, uh, we've got an act of uh, communion, Holy Communion Eucharist in the old church. At uh, the same time, Wednesday, 7.45. Uh, we've got information on our pew sheet about upcoming lunchtime concerts. If you've never been to one of our lunchtime concerts, uh, they're really great. The quality of music is so good. And uh, everyone I've been to have absolutely loved. And you get all sorts of different uh, types. The next one's going to be Simon Carey uh, performing a piano recital. And... Uh, uh, Two other bits of news. Uh, one uh, sad news, Doreen Elliott, who's been known to us for a long time, long-standing member of, uh, of our church here, who's been uh, in a care home for several years now. Um, she died this week. 
and uh, I get, went to go and see her just before she died to pray with her. Uh, she was an incredible lady. I've known her these last four years since I've been here at St. Peter's, and, uh, and it's such a joy to go and see her. And she would always make so much effort when she knew I was coming. She just looked splendiferous, if that's a word. And uh, we want to give thanks for her life, for her faith, and details on her funeral will be uh, upcoming in the next week or so. Um, also, we've got uh, some bands of marriage to read as well. So I published the bands of marriage between Ryan Peter Hawkes of the parish of St. Peter's West Blatchington and Haley Ann Kinlock, also of the parish of St. Peter's West Blatchington. This is of the first time of asking, and if anyone has any reason in law why they may not be married, you are to declare it now. That's good. Well, let's have a prayer for Ryan and Haley. Lord, we thank you so much for the gift of marriage and of love. And we pray for Ryan and Haley as they approach their wedding day, that you'd be with them and guide them and helping them to know your love for one another. For we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, now we're going to have our first Bible reading. Uh, you can follow along with a few, few different ways. It will appear on the screen. Uh, it's also the first reading in our pew sheet. We're not going to have the longer reading um, but you can always read that at home later on, see how it's relevant. So Jane, thank you. Apostles. The whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. This is the word of the Lord. Today's psalm is Psalm 133, and the response between each verse is on the screen. So let us say this together. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. How very good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. It is like the precious oil on the head, running down upon the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down over the collar of his robes. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls in the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord ordained his blessing, life forevermore. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Would you please stand for our gospel reading? The Lord be with you. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. On that same day, the first day of the week, two of the apostles, oh sorry, that's the wrong reading. There we go start again shall we hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John when it was evening on that day the first day of the week and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews Jesus came and stood among them and said peace be with you after he said this he showed them his hands and his side then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord Jesus said to them again peace be with you as the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. 
If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please do be seated. So I thought I'd start with a uh, question just to get us all thinking this morning. I do have a chat with the person next to you and then perhaps we can feedback one or two ideas. Um, what reasons do we have to celebrate Easter? Maybe just turn to the person next to you. It could be all sorts. There's big reasons, there's little reasons. Have a chat with the person next to you. You've got 10 seconds and think about what are some of the reasons that we have to celebrate Easter? Now, I could hear some good murmuring, some good ideas. Is anyone feeling brave and wants to share what they think? What are some good reasons that we've got to celebrate Easter? I heard lots of, lots of discussion. Oh, James, I can see your hand. Are you going to shout out? Nice and loud so we can all hear. What reason have we got to celebrate Easter? Jesus died for our sins. That's a really good reason to celebrate Easter. Well done. Yeah, who else have we got? So, oh, maybe some hands go. Audrey, yes. Say again. Yes, because it's all about our religion, what we believe. Yeah, absolutely. It's so central to it, isn't it? Absolutely. Well done. Sammy, yes. Great, so it, it's, it's spring and we remember new growth, new life and everything that goes with it. Who's been enjoying all the new life and we went to see some lambs yesterday and all the, all the wonderful things that we see, absolutely. Any other, maybe two more answers. Uh, any of you guys in the front row who haven't said anything? Anyone else at the back? Terry, yes. Meeting friends you haven't seen for a long time. Yeah, absolutely. There's normally time we can get together, see people, people that we love and care for. Perhaps we haven't seen for a while. That's a good idea too. Maybe one more. Jonathan. Resurrection. Resurrection. Thank you for saying that one, which segues beautifully into my first point. Well, that's great. And I think that's probably the main reason. All those other reasons that you were saying, they're really good. They're really good things to do with Easter. But the reason why we celebrate is because of the resurrection. It's because Jesus is alive. And that means that we are an Easter people. Easter marks us out. As followers of Jesus, is something totally different to anything else in the world. Because we believe that Jesus rose again, he is alive. He is alive. It's the reason why we're here. If Jesus wasn't resurrected, if that first Easter Sunday didn't happen, well, Christianity wouldn't exist. Jesus would have gone down the list of a lot of the many great wise people, or perhaps slightly foolish people, who said incredible things, but because of the resurrection, everything changes. Um, a recent survey found out that about 45% of the population 
um, which I thought was quite a high number, believe in the resurrection of Jesus in some way. For, so just under half people believe in Jesus' resurrection in some way, which is interesting because that's a much larger percentage than the population who would consider themselves practicing Christians, people who attend church regularly, who pray, who read the Bible. So a lot of people do have, nearly half of the population, believe in the resurrection of Jesus in some way. But about two-thirds of them had reservations about the story and about what's been passed down and, and how literal it is. So actually, it feels like, as we've, we come off um, from Easter Sunday, it feels like now's a really good chance for us to explore that a bit. So that's what we're going to do over the next 10 minutes. We're going to explore um, Easter and particularly the resurrection. We're going to ask two questions. We're going to ask, how should we understand the resurrection of Jesus? Will we take it literally, metaphorically? Is it just a nice story? How should we understand it? And secondly, why does it matter? Why does it matter, this claim that Jesus rose again? So let's think about how we should understand it. Now, you should have, um, if you've got with you, you can either fill them in now if you've got a pen or a pencil, or you can fill them in later. Uh, in, your, um, in your handout, uh, there was a little thing with some spaces. So if you want to, you can fill those in as we go and to help you understand. And it's the kind of thing that people might ask us. We might go home or see family or friend this week, and they say, you go to church. What's all this stuff about the resurrection? Or you can say, ah, and then just look at your little piece of paper to remind you. That's not bad. It's not bad having hints and reminders. So, so let's think about what is the first question. How should we understand it? Well, what is the evidence? What is the evidence for the resurrection? Well, the first thing is that the evidence is good. We've got lots of different pieces of evidence that we can use to help us to believe that Jesus' resurrection really did happen. It's not just a nice story. That might be a shock for a lot of people. That might be a shock for you. There's lots of evidence that helps us to see that believing in Jesus' resurrection actually makes sense. Most scholars would believe, even if they don't believe in the resurrection, they believe that Jesus existed. So the next question is, did he really rise again? So we're going to look at a few different places, and um, we're going to go, go around, do things slightly differently this morning. The first thing is, what does the New Testament give us? The New Testament contains all sorts of evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. Firstly, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They are eyewitness accounts, and each one builds up uh, a different story and picture that work together of Jesus' resurrection. And each gospel is slightly different. Mark, the second gospel, um, he's very quick and to the point. He doesn't give us much information, but he gives us enough to know that Jesus rose again and how that affected the disciples. Others, like John, who we just heard, our gospel reading was from John's gospel, um, they contain much more detail about what happened afterwards and some of the interactions that Jesus had with his followers and with other people. Then you've got um, uh, Luke's gospel, Luke He's done a part two, the book of Acts, which we heard from as well. And that's what happened after Jesus rose and his, uh, he ascended back into heaven. So we've got the gospel accounts there as evidence, people writing down. Luke starts his gospel by saying, I want to make an orderly account of the things that have happened. He was a doctor. He wanted to write out the information so that we could have what we need to believe that it really happened. So you've got the evidence from the gospel, you've got evidence in the book of Acts as well, but also you've got the evidence in the letters, all the letters that people like Paul and John and Peter were writing to different churches, well they wouldn't make any sense at all if Jesus didn't rise again. All of their arguments, all, all of their pleas wouldn't make any sense at all, you would have no point writing those letters. Because the whole point, they're trying to say, remember that Jesus has risen. This is how you need to live as a result. This is how you need to think, remembering that he'll one day come back. None of those letters make sense without the resurrection. But also, if we go earlier on in the Bible, we look at the Old Testament, we see uh, prophecy. We see hope, particularly in things like in the Psalms. We pop up on the screen, Psalm 16, verse 10, where the psalmist writes, because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful ones see decay. This is a prophecy about the Lord Jesus and the fact that God won't abandon him to death, but he will raise him back to life again. And these Old Testament writers, they lived hundreds of years before Jesus came, but God helped them to see that actually there was hope that death is not the end. They didn't know Jesus, they lived before he came, 
but God gave them hope that they needed to see that it was really true. They just didn't know how it was going to happen. We're the fortunate ones. We can look back and see this is how God worked it all out. They just hoped that God was going to do it. And it's only through Jesus that we can understand how death is defeated and we can have hope of eternal life. And the prophets also bore witness to this hope. Um, A couple of verses here uh, from Hosea 6 verse 2. After two days he will revive us. On the third day he will restore us that we may live in his presence. I don't know, does that remind you of something? It's the Easter story, isn't it? That God will raise Jesus back to life. And Job, which has often been thought to be one of the earliest writings, uh, this great long sort of poem, uh, he says this, despite all the terrible things Job goes through, he says, and after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. There's a hope, not just in going to heaven as a disembodied spirit, but somehow of life after death where we have real bodies. This is a resurrection hope. So that's the second thing we see the witness of the Old Testament. Thirdly, we see the witness of the early church. The apostles went to horrible deaths. Jesus' followers, they went to horrible deaths. Why? It's because they refused to deny what they had seen. That Jesus really did rise again. He was resurrected. Now, if you make up some grand, wonderful story, like the fact that your leader died and he came back to life, well, that's going to be hard to hold on to when people are threatening your life, isn't it? You would expect at least one of them to have said, oh, no, no, sorry, we just made it up. It was all just a prank. But none of them did. They all went to horrible deaths because they refused to deny what they had seen with their own eyes and, like Thomas, what he had felt with his own hands. They knew it to be true, and they knew it to be important. And we see that witness lived out in the life of the early church. And fourth, we also see the change of Jewish practice. Don't forget, Jesus' disciples, they were Jews, and that meant that their special holy day was a Saturday, the Sabbath day. But then we see that they start gathering on the Sunday. Why the Sunday? Well, that was the first day of the week, and that was the day that Jesus rose. That's why we meet and worship on a Sunday. It's the first day of the week. It's the day of Jesus' resurrection. And that was such a deeply embedded tradition that people would meet on Saturdays. It lasted hundreds and hundreds of years. But it was changed because the Sunday became the day of resurrection. And every Sunday is a resurrection Sunday. But it had to take something earth-shattering like the Messiah dying and rising again on a Sunday for first century Jews to make that change. But also we've got... uh, Sources outside of the Bible, uh, early writers from the first and second century, Josephus, Suetonius, Pliny the Younger, described how the followers of Jesus Christ believed him to be resurrected and were being persecuted as a result. But lastly, and sort of personally, the evidence that many of us have from having Jesus alive, interacting with us week by week, answering prayer when we pray to him, bringing healing physically, mentally, spiritually, moving us, guiding us, shaping us, freeing us from addiction, from arrogance and fear. We have the personal witness of his risen work in our life. So what was it like? Well, and shorter this one, Jesus rose bodily. Jesus rose bodily. He had a real spiritual body. I'll unpack what that means. So um, in Luke's gospel, you've got the the, the account where uh, Jesus meets Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus has died. And um, Jesus commanded Lazarus to come out of the tomb and he came back to life. But that's not what Jesus' resurrected body was like. It's not just dying and then coming back to life in order to grow old and then die again. That's what happened to Lazarus. There's something different with Jesus, with his body. It's, it's similar, but it's also different as well, isn't it? I wonder if you've got that impression um, from hearing that gospel. So, for example, he's, he's eating food. Uh, he can be touched. He can talk. But also he can just appear somewhere. So it's similar, but it's, it's different. He's not just come back to life to get older and then die again. He's come back in a a new sort of way. He's got a resurrected, a a heavenly body. 
He's not exactly the same, but there's continuity. He's still got the scars from where he was crucified. He's got a transformed body. And Paul says this about this change with the resurrected or the heavenly body in 1 Corinthians. He says, the body that is sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. So it is a real body, but it's not a body that gets ill, that breaks, that hurts. But also, like Jesus, he's able to appear and disappear and be touched. We heard in our gospel reading, then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Jesus wasn't then just brought back to life, but neither was he just a spirit. Some people said he just kind of came back to spiritually like a ghost. Well, I don't know any ghosts who sit down and you can give hugs to and will eat food and can be touched and hugged. He had a real body, but a heavenly body, a resurrected body. And that kind of gives us a glimpse of what someday we can have too. We'll get to that in a moment and why that's good news. And then thirdly on this, the evidence, well, who was involved? Well, the Father and the Spirit were involved in Jesus' resurrection. This is the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all at work. The Father and the Spirit raised the Son. Acts 2, 24 says this, but God, that is the Father, raised him, Jesus, from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible to death to keep its hold on him. So it was impossible for death to, to hold on to Jesus because Jesus is God. He's the author of life. Death couldn't hold on to him. There's too much life in him for death to hold on. But also Paul says this in Romans 8, and if the spirit of him, that's the spirit of Jesus, who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. So Paul says the same Holy Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead those 2,000 years ago is at work at you, is at work in each one of you who follows Jesus. That's, that's the hope. God doesn't say, great, wonderful, you've become a believer, now carry on and try not to mess it up. He goes, says, no, I'm going to come and make my home in you. I'm going to live in you. I'm going to help you to be the kind of person I want you to be, to be transformed, to be more like my son. But why does all of this matter? Well, let's move on then to the second bit. Why does it matter? Well, the resurrection matters because firstly, it guarantees our new life. It guarantees our new life. Peter says this, he says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he's given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So Jesus proved what he said he could do for us. He said he came as a ransom, he came to save us. And he proved that by rising again, by being resurrected. Paul elsewhere says, he was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. Justification is one of those big Bible words. It means that we've been put in the right with God. We've got a right relationship with him. It was broken before we came to Christ, but now through Jesus, his death and resurrection, we have a right relationship with, life, with God. I like to remember justification like this. It's just if I live Jesus' life. That's how God looks on his children. It's just if I had lived Jesus' life and I had that relationship with him. He's my father. So the way that you see Jesus speaking to his father, Abba, Father, we now have that relationship too because we've been justified and we do that by trusting in Jesus. The second thing is this guarantees our new bodies. I don't know about you, but this I'm finding increasingly um, uh, part of my hope is for a new body, one that doesn't get sick, one that doesn't break. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians, he says, by his power, God raised the Lord from the dead and he will raise us also. Elsewhere, the Bible talks about Jesus being the first fruit. Now, if you look out in your garden, perhaps you might see fruit start coming out on, on some of the, the fruit trees in your garden. And that's a picture of what Jesus is like. He's the trailblazer. He's that first fruit to say, yeah, the others are coming along soon. You just have to wait. The first fruit is a sign that the tree is good and the other fruit will follow. We're that other fruit. He's the trail break, blaze. He's the one leading the way and making it possible for us, but also showing it what it will be like, what our new body will be like. Our new bodies will be the same, but they'll be different. 
You see, our our hope is not that um, we just go to heaven as disembodied spirits and kind of float around like a sort of a Philadelphia advert, but actually our hope is in resurrected bodies like Jesus had. A hope in a new earth where there's no more war, there's no more pain, there's no more sadness, sickness or death. Heaven and earth joined together and that we get perfect bodies. Now, what do they look like? Well, that's a surprise, I don't know. There's clearly bits that we can recognize one another. The disciples could normally recognize Jesus, but there won't be anything bad. But there might be scars. Remember, Jesus had scars on his hands and his side to show what he'd been through, but they were no longer causing him pain. They were scars of his glory, of what he went through because he loved God. So maybe you might have scars too, scars that other people can't see of of things that you've been through that God has helped you with for other people to see and to other people to praise God for because of how he worked through your scars. And lastly then, the resurrection, it shapes how we live. How can it not? How can the fact that Jesus rose again and is alive not shape how we live? These words from Colossians 3, it says, since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. I don't know about you, but I find it really easy to set my mind on earthly things. Money, relationships, health, how I'm doing. It's easy, isn't it? But Paul says here, because Jesus has risen, we don't need to do that anymore. We can set our minds on him, on Christ. Because that is the future. That is the hope. And because of the resurrection, our lives are different. That means if you're here and you've decided to follow Jesus, this means that change must happen. It's inevitable, really. You can't stay the same if you really do believe that Jesus is risen. Perhaps you're not sure you're exploring that for the moment, but that's great that you're here. In which case, keep thinking about this. Maybe ask God, speak to him, say, how can I believe this? How can I know it's true? Maybe it's something for today. Maybe you need to go away and read the Bible for yourself. Look at those Easter accounts and and think about what it means for your life. What I want us to do, normally give sort of more application at the end and think about these things you need to do. Well, that's kind of over to you. Now, last week and this week, uh, there were little sheets that had a question. And the question said, how does Jesus being raised from the dead give you hope, strength and peace? Now, this is totally up to you, but I, I wanted to give you all a little bit of homework. And the idea is that there are those sheets available if you didn't pick up one last week or if you've lost it. Take that away and I want you to think about what Easter means to you based on what we've heard. How does Jesus being raised from the dead give you hope? How does it give you strength? And how does it give you peace? And the first thing I want you to do is to think about that. Maybe write something down, maybe draw something if you want to on that piece of paper. And that's firstly for you. Secondly, is if you feel that you want to, to, to write something down, I'd love you to then bring that back next Sunday so that we can share those. Now, we can make them anonymous if you'd rather write something down and not want anyone to know, that's fine. And Reverend Yan is going to read some of those out. Or perhaps you're feeling brave, and this would really encourage one another. You might even come up and, and, and read what you'd put down. It doesn't have to be perfect, but it should be from the heart. How does this help you? How does Jesus being raised from the dead give you hope strength and peace so do write something down on there if you can and if you are able to bring it back next week and give it to Reverend Yan so you can read those out that would be wonderful in the meantime though let me close with a prayer loving God we thank you for Jesus that he died that he rose again and thank you Lord that for all the evidence that we have that helps us in our faith and Lord we know that evidence alone isn't enough but we need to believe, we need to trust. So Lord, we pray that you would give us the gift of faith to believe in Jesus and what he has done for us. Please give us confidence and to help us to think about how this is good news, for we ask in Jesus' name, amen. We're now going to have a song that's going to appear on the screen. This is a new song probably to most of us. So what we're going to do is we're going to uh, sit and listen to the first verse and, uh, and then when the second verse and the chorus comes around, I invite you to stand. It's a fairly easy tune to pick up. Um, if you'd rather just sit and listen, that's fine. Um, but I'm going to be standing, so if you want to stand with me and sing. But we'll listen to the first verse and then we'll stand. When they took down his body Hope had faded
in you Life has come breaking through The sun has risen shining bright We have seen glorious light Christ the Lord is risen The dawn of a new day When the stone was rolled summary of what uh, the church has taught for the last 2,000 years from the Bible about who God is and who we are made to be. So it will appear both on the screen and also on page five of our booklets. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us, for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. So would you please be seated as we now continue in a time of prayer. And today's prayers were written by Rev. Yan, who is um, somewhere on the other side of the world at the moment, I think. But he promised he'll be back for next Sunday. But he's very kindly sent through uh, prayers for us today. So let's pray to God. Faithful God, we praise you for the resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, from the dead. 
shed his glorious light on all Christian people, that we may live as those who believe in the triumph of the cross. Almighty God, we ask you to be a real and living presence in your church throughout the world. May St. Peter's Church, through its preaching and works of love, continue to testify to our Lord's resurrection. Wherever we are lacking in faith and courage, strengthen us with your spirit. Lord, we pray that you would meet with every person in our parish, especially for those who live in Eridge Road and Fallowfield Close. And we lift up to you the mission and ministry of the Hangleton and West Blatchington Food Bank. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful God, we pray for peace in our troubled world. Wherever nations are at war and people are suffering, we pray for true reconciliation. We particularly remember the conflicts involving Russia and Ukraine, Israel and Palestine. But we also lift up countries including Myanmar, Somalia, Syria and Yemen, which are still suffering the devastation of conflict but rarely appear in the news. Protect all Christian people in the nations of the world, Heavenly Father, and help them to influence their country for the good of all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father God, we pray for all families whose homes are disrupted by anger and bitterness and where relationships are breaking up. We thank you for the gift of your Son, our Saviour, who walks with us on our life's journeys. And as he is glad in the hearts of his friends when they saw him raised from the dead, may he travel alongside all who are struggling with their family life. We pray for members of our Christian family across the Anglican Communion, especially the Episcopal Anglican Province of Alexandria, and in our diocese, the church buildings and pastoral reorganization team. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, comfort the sick and suffering with your loving presence. Heal and strengthen weak bodies, calm, confused minds, and reassure the lonely with your company. We raise before you those we know with particular needs we have been asked to pray for, including Jane Bosworth and Beryl Reeves, as well as all those who we pray for in our monthly prayer service. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful God, we remember before you those who have died in the hope of the resurrection. Unite us with them in your undying love. Help us to always remember that death could not hold your son, Jesus Christ, and that new life for him means new life for all who believe in him. So we commend to you those known and loved by us who have recently died, including Doreen Elliott. And on the anniversaries of their deaths, we remember and give thanks for Kathleen Butterworth, Keith Loadsman, Percy Newcomb, Elizabeth Manhire, Dave Duncan, Vera Moore, John Casemore, Father Keith Wood, Arthur Norman, and Shirley Axton. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, your Son, Jesus Christ, stands among us, and we have seen the marks of your saving love. Breathe on us with the power of your Holy Spirit, and send us out to share the peace of Christ with all who may cross our paths in the weeks ahead. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, in just a moment, we're going to be celebrating the meal that Jesus gave to his followers and uh, as we do that, um, everyone is welcome who is a believer and as you uh, normally receives communion to come forward and to receive the bread and the wine. Uh, if you want to come forward but you're not sure about receiving communion, that's absolutely fine. Please feel free when invited to come forward and just put your hands by your side and I'll just pray uh, for you in that moment. Uh, but firstly, what we do is we share something called the peace, which is uh, an, a part where we remember how through faith in Jesus we have peace with God and God wants us to share that peace with one another. He doesn't want us to be uh, holding grudges and unforgiveness against each other. So it's a sign of the peace that we need to show with one another. But it might remind you that actually maybe uh, you haven't forgiven something, maybe someone in your family or in your household, and you need to actually after this service go home and, and ask for forgiveness or offer forgiveness to them as well. So would you please stand? Jesus Christ is the King of kings and the Prince of peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. So whether using a handshake or a wave or however you feel, let us offer one another now a sign of God's peace.
Um, can I ask if anyone requires gluten-free bread? No? Okay. So may the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. And let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Father, we give you thanks and praise through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, your living word, through whom you have created all things, who was sent by you in your great goodness to be our Savior. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he took flesh as your Son, born of the Blessed Virgin. He lived on earth and went about among us. He opened wide his arms for us on the cross. He put an end to death by dying for us and revealed the resurrection by rising to new life. So he fulfilled your will and won for you a holy people. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Lord, you are holy indeed, the source of all holiness. Grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit and according to your holy will, these gifts of bread and wine may be to us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, who in the same night that he was betrayed, took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. And so, Father, calling to mind his death on the cross, his perfect sacrifice made once for the sins of the whole world, rejoicing in his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, and looking for his coming in glory, we celebrate this memorial of our redemption. As we offer you this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, we bring before you this bread and this cup, and we thank you for counting us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you. Send the Holy Spirit on your people and gather into one in your kingdom all who share this one bread and one cup so that we in the company of all the saints may praise and glorify you forever through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory be yours, almighty Father, forever and ever. Amen. So let us pray with confidence the prayer our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. So we break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy upon us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy upon us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant us peace. So draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. We do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. 
we are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen.
Let us say together the prayer after communion. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. Thank you for joining us, whether in person or online. Do hope uh, you come back to one of our services. We meet together every Sunday at 10 o'clock. Sunday by Sunday, our services change. Sometimes we're all together. Uh, Sometimes there's Sunday school. Uh, Sometimes uh, our service looks a bit more informal as well. Um, But the thing that unites all together is actually the risen Jesus is here amongst us, and he makes a difference. Uh, If you want to find out more about what's happened to the life of St. Peter's, we've got these uh, lovely new welcome packs. Uh, Just ask for one of those, and uh, we'll be glad to give you one of those. You can fill out details, find out more about what happens here at St. Peter's Church family. Also, please feel free to come over across to the hall. We're going to be having tea and coffee, and there's normally something uh, sweet and tasty as well. Uh, So don't miss out on that. That would be great. Well, please stand. We're going to pray for God's blessing, and then we're going to sing our final hymn. So may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep our hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his risen Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. So go in love, sorry, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia. In the name of Christ. Alleluia. Alleluia.